Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's about the time that we start. Um, session two, the topic is tra tra tackling sexual violence in Myanmar and in the regions. Um, before we invite a moderate moderator and uh, speakers to the stage, I'd like to show um, documentary film first. So when you saw the other day, when I made fell in jail, I was so bad that my home was not safe. Now I'm here to help you. Go to the hospital. Get up. Get up. Don't be shy. And if you die now, you'll be safe. I'm coming. I'm ready. 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 In 2011, Myanmar, also called Burma, began the transition to democracy from half a century of military dictatorship. Four years later, several thousand people attended the funeral of two school teachers. Both young women were brutally raped and murdered, allegedly by soldiers from the Burmese army. Rape as a weapon of war committed by the Burmese military has been documented across the country but no one has been held accountable for these crimes. This story is from two communities in Burma where women are calling for justice. The Rohingya from Western Rakhine State and the ethnic Kachin who live 1,000 kilometers away in the north. Shamima and her family lived for generations in Rakhine State, but like most Rohingya, were not granted citizenship by the Burmese government. She is among the one million Rohingya who fled ethnic cleansing carried out by the Burmese military and is now living in the world's largest refugee camp. Only a handful of Rohingya girls go beyond a primary school education. Most are illiterate. Shamima was in her third year at Sitwe University when violence targeting Rohingya communities crushed her dream to become a teacher. She's now using her skills to counsel the survivors of rape. <laughs> Sixteen-year-old Dil Kayas was very close to her sisters and brothers. 
हाथारी फंगा दे रहे थे खुशी थी हसने मारे रहते दुआ रे लंच मारिए रे गोली मारी को दर दी गई माँ मिटाइए बाप मिटाइए बन मिटाइए तरह लोन न भाई स्कूल गल रे आर सात जने दरी गल फिले आरे पूजे Far from where Shamima lived, Burma's northern Kachin state is also in crisis, and women there have reported rape by the Burmese military. In 2011, when government forces broke a ceasefire with the ethnic Kachin army, war resumed. Tango ante go go ya den ta. मचान बीन तो आए मोटना से फेन मसाने कई लो सिंह खुखांग तो leads a Kachin women's human rights organization called Quad that advocates for women affected by human rights abuses. रोहिन चानी ने सिंह तो यंग हो संदेह को लगता बुंग आई मिशा सेम साथ एक बीन है अंधे को एक बीन है मरांग एको Twenty-year-old Lura and twenty-one-year-old Khon Nan Sin were volunteer teachers at a village school for poor ethnic Kachin and Shan children. They came to the village school for poor ethnic Kachin and Shan children. They came to the village school for poor ethnic Kachin and Shan children. They came to the village school for poor ethnic Kachin and Shan children. They came to the village school for poor ethnic Kachin นึกว่าจะให้มาเดินชาเลยท่านเนี่ยมานี่มาเดินชาอากาศกันเลยอ่ะชิโกกับป้าก้องสองเนี่ยชิโกใกล้ไว้กันเลยแล้วแต่ไ
الدنيا ده ربايا جاي جاي اردي لو بعدي جاي انت لما ده اردي هذا ما يجي Dil Kayas ran toward the river to find a scene of chaos as families scrambled to escape to neighboring Bangladesh. Crouched alone by the riverbank, she saw her grandmother. <laughs> Dil Kayas never saw her mother, father, and eight brothers and sisters again. Lubu's family live in a camp for internally displaced refugees in Kachin state. This is the second time they've had to run from the war. Entire communities are traumatized by violent crimes committed by the military and need support to recover from the horrors they have witnessed.
tate hori hori lu mal kwa vala yatu te tate tu kwa vala yero bade ara e puli tara te puli hore bade go jadde go zorde ni diri mani ma ke he mori ve shamade tu je ma shi atinda atinda mori ye yong pe shukum ya sana temati da ene shukum da shuna de khone a ne ki kuna i emre misum be o kalang da prong ashle kap sat ko ya de ene na jong ma mana ngom re le khong lo ma je mre ngai mi go de bo de chan ga kai bong san kai pian ma che khe da kai sang be je ane put di na ki pi se ana khong ma ดูงระบาดกุซอร์ฟัวกุเนลวะบุราฟัวมาติแมชัตเตอร์แมชัวอีเวดากุเตอุตะเลเรมาลามาจีมาลามาจีเดียนเดระไซเตกิเดระติป
दिल के आसो तो एज जन दुजन कर डाके फोन जा सदा त लाइयो गतो त फोन जा कलो शेयर गोरी फारे दे निजर हता गम लागे रेन बोली होया तो यार यो गतो यो गरियो इल्ला फोन ना ला सत लाइयो ब फोन ना के जिनिस देन ने गो नो बुजे दे रोहिंग <laughs> Jango ande ni sholam de sawa de ta ande ni min ngun cha na i The Kachin Women's Rights Group Quad emboldens women to speak out They got ni sa ko ya mi cho de tin tan ni lung i tan ni lung am cha ni ko San Lung and Lubu formed a support group with Kachin women who suffered human rights abuses. They now help other women affected by conflict. Ya sho ka kan de glo to ma ko de ji rung kan ni le i. Eh de hu le ma ma u ma pom ko pye po i de me na chuan ni sa thong da pom sa ko pye po na ji rung sa lo ko to ko ra ni ne lo khong pyan ni sa khrum ka sa. Seng Jia was 10 years old when her older sister Kan Nan Sin was killed. ยองนี่รับรับรายรายละเอียดมันชาแนลนี่ได้ติมุงผัดที่เจนี่ได้ติมุงพายาทุกกบานี่ได้ติมุงแล้วมันยาอันเตจิงโผกินราก็อ่า
After seeing the testimonies of Lu Bu and San Lung, Shumima shared a message of solidarity with them, speaking in Burmese, a second language for all of them. Women in other ethnic areas in Burma have also joined the call for an end to the crime of rape in conflict areas. In 2018, the Karen Women Organization sent out a message stating, We have personally experienced rape as a weapon of war by the Burma Army. We had hoped we were one of the last groups of women to suffer at their hands. Sadly, we were not. No woman from Burma of any background should experience these attacks. Um, I'd like to invite a moderator and speakers to the front. Yeah. Um, the moderator for this session is Kim Mai Aung, so writer and civil rights lawyer from the United States. Thank you. It's a hard act to follow. Um, so you won't be hearing too much from me because I want to make sure we have plenty of time to speak to the moderators. I'm getting a little old, so I need these glasses now. Um, we've changed um, the order of our presentation a little bit um, because uh, the content that uh, Miang Yun is presenting is going to be about the local context here, and then uh, Rahima and Farhanao are going to be talking more about uh, Myanmar and, and the Southeast Asia, South Asia region. So with that, let me start by um, introducing Miang Yoon, who is a representative of the Korean Council for Justice and Remembrance for Issues of Military Sexual Slavery by Japan. She's been working um, on the comfort women advocacy issue for many years, including protesting in front of the Japanese embassy for more than 27 years. And she's worked closely with the United States and European parliaments on resolutions regarding the comfort women issue. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, 굉장히 영상을 보면서 가슴이 무거움을 느끼는데요. 
그래도 첫 시작을 희망으로 시작을 좀 하고 싶습니다. 희망을 어디에서 우리가 찾을 수 있을지 희망을 어떻게 만들어낼 수 있을지 저희들의 지난 30여 년의 한국에서의 그리고 국제사회에서의 활동을 토대로 이야기를 해보고 싶습니다. 이 여성은 우간다 내전에서 16살 때 신의 저항군이라는 방군에게 성폭력 피해를 입었습니다. 아버지는 어, 딸이 보는 데서 살해를 당했고 엄마도 언니도 성폭행 피해를 입었습니다. 그런데 어, 자신의 삶을 포기하지 않고 피해자를 지원하는 단체를 만들어서 지금 그 단체 대표를 맡고 있고요. 이 여성을 일본군 위안부 피해자들이 약 2년 전에 만났습니다. 무엇보다도 한국에서 어, 여성 인권 운동가로 이미 또 평화운동가로 수많은 청소년들에게 존경을 받고 있는 김복동 할머니 그리고 길원옥 할머니 두 분을 이 여성이 만났습니다. 처음에 만났을 때는 저도 아직 똑똑하게 기억하고 있습니다. 여전히 눈동자가 어, 제대로 사람의 눈동자를 마주하지 못할 정도로 그 피해 속에 어, 지내고 있었고요. 어, 그런데 김복동 할머니를 피해자를 만나서 김복동 할머니가 끝까지 싸워라 끝까지 싸워서 우리 이기자라는 그런 격려와 지지를 받게 되고 거의 28년 동안 포기하지 않고 데모를 하고 세계 각지를 돌아다니면서 목소리를 내고 있는 그 한국의 일본군 위안부 피해자들을 보면서 이 여성은 큰 용기를 얻습니다. 그래서 음, 지난해 저희 정의연이 김복동 할머니의 기부금으로 만든 김복동 평화상을 수상을 했습니다. 이제 이 여성은 이렇게 얘기합니다. 김복동은 우리의 희망이고 우리의 영웅이고 김복동이라는 이름이 우간다 여성들에게는 굉장히 큰 의미가 있습니다. 라고 이야기를 하고 있습니다. 이 여성은 코소보 내전에서 세르비아계 경찰에게, 경찰들에게 성폭행 피해를 입었습니다. 역시 그녀의 나이 16살 때였습니다. 어, 자국에서 소송을 했고, 소송 끝에 대법원은 가해자들에게 무죄를 선고를 했습니다. 어, 살 수가 없었어요. 자기 나라에서. 미국에서 결혼을 해서 살던 중에, 역시 2년 전에 일본군 위안부 피해자들이 유엔에서 활동을 하는 그 현장에서 함께 만났고 어, 저 역시 저 여성 옆에 바로 앉아서 스피치를 준비하고 있었습니다. 근데 그때 저 여성은 한국말로 이런 말이 있습니다. 사시나무 떨듯이 뜬다. 여전히 그 성폭력 피해 경험으로부터 벗어나지 못해서 더군다나 자기 자신의 경험을 수많은 사람들 앞에서 이야기를 해야 한다는 것 때문에 온몸이 바들바들 떨고 있었습니다. 그날 유엔 회의장에서 열렸던 사이드 이벤트에서는 결국 자기 자신의 증언을 구체적으로 할 수도 없었습니다. 근데 그 여성을 지난해 8월에 한국에 저희들이 초청을 했고 한국에서 일본군 성노예 피해자들이 직접 자신의 목소리를 내고 인권운동을 하고 있는 피해자들을 만나고 한국에서 수많은 청소년들이 수많은 시민들이 여성들이 일본군 위안부 피해자들과 함께 손잡고 거리에서 소리 치르고 함께 춤을 추고 노래하고 거의 축제처럼 그렇게 활동을 하는 것을 보고 역시 이 여성이 굉장히 큰 힘을 얻습니다. 그리고 올해 김복동 평화상을 두 번째로 수상을 하게 됩니다. 이번에 수상을 하기 위해서 서울에 왔을 때이 여성이 이렇게 얘기합니다. 김복동 할머니를 만나서 끝까지 싸우자 하는 이야기를 듣고 제가 굉장히 큰 용기를 받았습니다. 그래서 드디어 저도 나처럼 코소보 내전에서 성폭력 피해를 입은 여성들을 찾아내기 위해서 목소리를 내게 하기 위해서 미투할 수 있게 하기 위해서 단체를 만들었고 활동을 시작했습니다. 많은 사람들이 앞에서 공개로 증언을 하기 시작했습니다. 라는 이야기를 합니다. 이 여성은 이라크 야지디족 여성입니다. 여동생과 함께 납치되어서 IS군에게 성노예로 
팔려다니고 끌려다니고 성폭력 당하고 그러나 이 여성은 도망을 쳐서 살아남았습니다. 독일에서 만났고요. 여동생은 여전히 성노예로 끌려다니고 있다고 합니다. 길원옥 할머니 역시 김복동과 함께 여성 인권운동을 하고 있는 길원옥 할머니가 독일 베를린에 가서 이 여성을 만났습니다. 이 여성은 길원옥의 증언을 들으면서 눈물을 흘렸고요. 그리고 길원옥은 저 여성의 이야기를 들으면서 손을 잡고 이렇게 이야기합니다. 얼마나 힘드니 여기 앉아있는 저 활동가들은 네가 얼마나 아팠을지 몰라도 나는 네가 얼마나 아팠을지 알수 있어. 왜? 내가 직접 겪어봤으니까. 한번 성폭행을 당했건 두번 성폭행을 당했건 1년 동안 그 일을 당했건 10년을 그 일을 당했건 아마 그 고통은 네 머릿속에서 지워지지 않을 거야. 근데 어떡하겠니? 우리가 참아내야지. 그러나 우리 아이들은 우리와 같은 이런 아픔을 겪으면 안 되니까 네하고 나하고 손을 잡고 열심히 싸우자. 내가 너 도와줄게. 이런 이야기를 합니다. 그렇게 해서 저 기로녹이라는 인권운동가를 일본군 성노예제 피해자를 만난 저 여성은 기로녹이 돌아온 이후에 역시 야지디적 피해자들을 성폭력 생존자들을 돕기 위한 단체를 만들어서 지금 활동을 시작했습니다. 2012년에 어, 저희, 저, 제가 일하고 있는 조직 The Korean Council for the Women Drafted for Military Sexual Slavery by Japan 정대엽은 지금 정의원이고요. 나비 기금을 만듭니다. 우리가 일본 정부에게 요구한 것은 피해자들이 일본 정부에게 요구한 것은 어, 가난하다고 혹은 불쌍하다고 금전적으로 위로금을 주라고 요구한 것이 아니었다. 이것은 명확하게 성폭력 범죄다. 그 범죄이기 때문에 가해자는 일본 정부는 범죄라는 것을 인정해야 되고 인정하에 공식 사죄하고 법적으로 배상해야 된다라는 요구를 했는데 일본 정부는 계속해서 우리가 요구하는 것이 마치 돈을 달라고 하는 것 같다. 그래서 만약 지금 아직 길은 까마득하지만 만약에 일본 정부가 법적 배상을 하게 되면 우리는 돈 때문에 이 운동을 했던 것이 아니기 때문에 그 배상금 전액을 저렇게 지금도 전쟁에서 성폭력 피해를 입고 있는 콩고와 우간다의 생존자들에게 전액 다 후원을 할 것이다. 라고 역시 김복동 기노옥 생존자가 인권운동가가 기자회견을 합니다. 그때 한국의 시민사회가 그두 분의 그 선언에 굉장히 숭고함을 느끼게 되고 그리고 기부가 잇따르게 됩니다. 그래서 그 기부금으로 가장 첫 번째 지원되기 시작한 것이 바로 콩고 내전에서 어, 당군에게 성폭력 피해를 입은 여성들 그리고 성폭력 피해로 태어난 아이들 그들의 마을 공동체에서 혹은 남편의 공동체에서 쫓겨난 여성들 그 여성들에게 나비기금이 지원되기 시작합니다. 저 여성들도 역시 이렇게 이야기합니다. 우리에게 희망이 없을 때 피해를 입었으면서도 본인들도 상처를 갖고 있으면서도 또 다른 상처를 갖고 있는 우리의 삶을 함께 보듬어줬던 한국의 그 할머니들에게 한국의 그 피해자들에게 우리는 희망을 얻었습니다. 우리는 용기를 얻었습니다. 라고 이야기를 합니다. 올해 저희가 나비기금이 날아간 곳은 나이지리아였습니다. 나이지리아에는 지금도 역시 정부군과 반군의 싸움이 계속되고 있습니다. 그 싸움에서 역시 여성들은 여성들에 대한 성폭력은 전쟁의 무기처럼 그렇게 사용되고 있는 현실이고요. 보코하람이라는 반군에 의해서 납치되었던 중학생들, 여중생들, 약 200여 명에 이르는 여중생들, 몇년 전에 세계를 떠들썩하게 했죠. 그 여중생들이 성노예로 끌려다니다가 그래도 집으로 돌아온 여성들이 있습니다. 하지만 그 여성들 역시 제대로 된 공동체 속에서 살수 없어서 난민으로 떠돌이 하면서 살 수밖에 없는 그런 현실들을 저희가 소식을 듣고 직접 올해 나비기금을 싸들고 지원하자. 우리 함께 연대하자. 단지 지원이 아니라 우리가 함께 손잡고 너희들이 처해 있는 그 공동체 그리고 우리가 처해 있는 공동체를 네 함께 싸워나가자. 라고 해서 나비가 날아갑니다. 
이 여성들에게 아직 우리는 우리가 희망을 얻었습니다. 라는 답, 응답은 받지 못하고 있습니다. 여기에 일본 정부 측에서 방해를 하기 시작했습니다. 저 단체는 일본을 이유 없이 헐뜯는 단체다. 그러니 저 단체하고 저 단체와 연대를 끊으면 일본 쪽에서 너희들을 더 지원하겠다. 라고 하는 회유와 또 다른 성폭력 피해자와 또 다른 성폭력 피해자들의 연대를 방해하는 일들이 있지만 저희들은 물론 멈추지 않을 것이죠. 그렇게 나비의 날개짓이 연대를 만들어내고 그 연대는 또 다른 피해자들에게 희망을 만들어내고 있습니다. 근데 여기에서 한 발짝 더 나아가서 피해자들은 직접 우리와 같은 성폭력 피해자들을 지원하고 이 문제를 해결하기 위해서 활동하는 활동가들을 키우자 라고 해서 역시 피해 당사자들이 정부의 지원금을 받은 것을 모아서 기부를 해서 저희 단체 안에 김복동 평화상, 길어녹 여성 평화상을 제정을 했고요. 김복동 평화상은 세계 무력 분쟁 지역의 성폭력 피해자들을 양성하고 그들에게 상을 주는 그래서 활동을 장려하는 그런 상으로 기로녹 여성평화상은 사실은 일본군 위안부 문제라는 것은 가해자가 반성하고 사죄하고 배상하는 것으로도 이루어져야 되지만 동시에 피해자들과 함께 살고 있는 피해국 사회가 피해자들을 향해서 너희들의 부끄러움으로 혹은 너희들의 탓으로 손가락질하고 편견하고 차별하는 이런 사회라면 아무리 가해자가 반성하고 해결한다 하더라도 그건 해결이 아니다. 즉 가부장제적인 한국 사회가 달라지지 않으면 여성 인권과 평화의 가치가 존중되는 그런 한국 사회가 되지 않으면 정의로운 사회가 되지 않으면 일본군 위안부 문제 진정한 해결이나 있을 수 없다. 따라서 가해자인 일본 정부의 반성과 해결도 있어야 되지만 한국 사회가 그런 평화로운 사회가 인권이 존중되는 사회가 될수 있도록 하기 위해서는 그런 수많은 인권 활동가들이 자라나야 된다, 계승돼야 된다라는 생각을 가지고 활동을 시작했고 첫 번째 기러녹 여성 평화상은 베트남의 미국 전쟁에서 한국군에 의해서 민간인 학살피해를 입었던 문제 그리고 한국군에 의해서 성폭력 피해를 입었던 문제 그 문제를 직면하고 평생을 청춘을 그 한국과 베트남의 평화 문제를 위해서 싸워온 구수정 씨에게 기러녹 여성 평화상을 수상을 합니다. 두 번째 기러녹 여성 평화상은 한국에는 여전히 성매매 피해자들을 발생시키는 사회 구조를 갖고 있습니다. 세계 어느 나라든 다 마찬가지라고 생각을 할 건데요. 그런데 특히 10대 여성들의 성매매 문제 10대 여성들의 인권 문제를 위해서 역시 청춘을 대학 졸업하자마자부터 거의 전생을 지금 바쳐나가고 있는 10대 여성 인권센터 조준경 대표가 제2회 기러녹 여성 평화상을 받습니다. 올해는 올해 기러녹 여성 평화상은 5.18 광주 민주화 항쟁 때 광주 민주화 항쟁 때 가두 방송을 이끌었던 그래서 그것 때문에 체포되어서 전두환 군사 독재 정권에 의해서 고문 피해를 받았던 이 차명숙 씨가 수상을 했습니다. 역시 해방 이후 한국의 군사 독재 정권 하에서 있었던 그런 국가의 폭력의 희생자들을 희생자들을 위한 그런 활동으로 일본군 위안부 피해자들의 활동은 건너가고 있고 연대하고 있고 나아가서는 세계 무력 분쟁 지역의 성폭력 피해자들을 키워내고 그들의 인권을 위해서 함께 연대하는 것뿐만 아니라 한국 사회 전반에 스며들어 있는 그런 국가폭력의 문제 그리고 성폭력 문화, 가부장제 문화 그 문화를 바꾸기 위해서 활동을 하고 있습니다. 이 여성의 목소리를 사실은 좀 들려주고 싶습니다만 제가 요약을 드리면 이분은 미군 기지촌에서 성폭력 피해를 입은 성매매 피해자입니다. 그런데 이 여성은 김복동 기로녹 할머니를 2010년도에 만났습니다. 그리고 그때 기로녹 할머니가 이렇게 얘기합니다. 너희들이 잘못이 없어. 왜? 국가가 그런 성폭력 문화를 조장하고 있었고 미군들에게 성매매 피해를 조장하는 정책을 갖고 있었더라면 그건 바로 국가의 잘못이고 한국 사회 탓이다. 그러니까 너희들이 부끄러워하지 말아라. 
정부를 상대로 소송을 하면 우리도 지원하겠고 정부를 상대로 데모를 하면 우리도 함께 지원하겠다. 기로넉 할머니가 저 피해자들을 직접 찾아 그렇게 얘기합니다. 그리고 이제는 저 여성들이 일본군 위안부 문제를 해결하기 위한 수요 시위에 매주 수요일마다 열리고 있는 수요 시위에 참석을 해서 이렇게 얘기합니다. 언니들이 우리에게 용기를 줘서 우리도 지금 한국 정부를 상대로 소송을 했고 우리를, 우리의 를우리 이야기를 우리의 역사를 다룬 연극의 주인공이 되고 있고 뮤지컬의 주인공이 되고 있습니다. 우리는 이제 더 이상 모자로 우리 얼굴을 가릴 필요도 없고 선글라스로 우리 얼굴을 가릴 필요도 없습니다. ていうきゃみだ。ていうきゃみだ。ていうきゃみだ。ていうきゃみだ。ていうきゃみだ。ていうきゃみだ。ていうきゃみだ。ていうきゃみだ。ていうきゃみだ。ていうきゃみだ。
an artist researcher and founder of the international human rights organization Restless Beings, um, which is a British charity which has worked with survivors of bride kidnapping in Kyrgyzstan, worked on the rights of Rohingya women, girls across South and Southeast Asia, and Rahima, in addition to her advocacy and humanitarian work, has also mobilized communities through creative and academic member, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> creative and academic endeavors to strengthen international resistance together. Great. Thank you, Kina. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to just begin by saying thank you to the organizers and Songang University for having us and for enabling this vital forum to happen. Um, after watching that uh, short film, I, I'm sure you'd all agree that um, the vision of uh, a woman getting raped and then her breast being cut and then her child who is already suffering, the breast being stuffed into that child's mouth is not the act of someone fulfilling their sexual pleasures or a spontaneous act in a conflict zone. This is state-led and systematic. So in the spirit of an activist, I present my paper. It's titled Genocidal Rape, Analysis of Tools and Tactics to Dehumanize a Community. As Professor Yang, Yang Yili mentioned this um, in the morning, the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1820 states that sexual violence is a tactic of war to humiliate, dominate, instill fear in, disperse and or forcibly relocate civilian members or, or of a community or an ethnic group. So throughout time, we've seen sexual violence, especially in the form of rape, being used to demoralize and destabilize entire communities, destroying the st structure of families and societies. In spaces of conflict, we cannot assume sexual violence is inevitable. When village elders are raped in public, or sons are forced to rape their mothers, or soldiers rape the women in a village with their brothers and husbands forced to watch, these acts are strategic and are efforts to annihilate an entire community. According to the 1948 Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of an ethnic, national or religious group and or deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part constitutes to genocide. This convention though does not explicitly state that sexual violence or rape is a crime of genocide. But we must only look to Rwanda, when in church convents, Tutsi nuns were made to dig their grave prior to being raped, killed, and then dumped into those mass graves. Rape was used as a weapon and tool to destroy Tutsi women. Many reports of children as young as six also being mass raped are available. By 1997, three years after the end of genocide, not a single person was tried with sexual violence, and the International Criminal Tribunal of Rwanda um, uh, suggest, had suggestions of rape as genocide, uh, had any suggestions of rape as genocide was ignored. Radhika Kumar Sawami in her 1998 report said sexual violence should be seen not only as rape, but be seen as torture, enslavement and genocide. So this shrewd state-led military tactic is hard to prove and with no physical evidence compared to killing where there is no corpse, rape is often an invisible strategy. In addition to this, the stigma associated with rape means the majority of women will not report it. Rape victims suffering does not stop at the act of rape itself, as the shame of returning to their communities and being ostracized and made into pariahs by their own families can often be labeled as the second rape. This is mentioned in Lisa Charlotte's study in 2010. This stigma and shame often makes the investi investigation into politicized and militarized rape virtually impossible. Sexual violence is also used to obtain information, for example, as a method of torture in detention centers. And during periods of genocide and ethnic cleansing, rape and many other forms of sexual violence is used to systematically attack the lineage of a group. For example, by impregnating or sterilizing women. These patterns can be seen in the case of Bosnia, when two million were displaced and there was a mushrooming, mushrooming of detention camps, beatings, forced cannibalisms and gang rapes were commonplace. Serb militia attacked villages and rapes took place en masse. Rape camps emerged and sexual violence took place 
uh, took place over a period of time and often they were filmed and shown on Serbian national television. Once a woman was impregnated in these camps, she was held under, uh, until the third trimester, so the baby cannot be aborted. The baby now has Serb paternal lineage, another attempt at demoralizing an entire community. The RAM plan in 1991 outlined the use of rape on Muslim women and children as military policy. The fact-finding mission estimated between 25 to 50,000 women aged between 7 and 65 were raped. Between 7 and 65. Again, we see the same vicious cycle in Bangladesh genocide, where in the space of nine months, almost 400,000 Bangladeshi women and girls were raped. Pakistani soldiers raided houses, raping women and girls, and then murdering them by spearing bayonets into their genitals. Mass rape camps were organized and women were forced into sex slavery. In 1971, the government of Bangladesh declared women who had been raped as birangona. I've worked with these women before, and the word itself, birangona, means war heroine. Many of these women were marginalized and eventually committed suicide. Professor Yang Lee mentioned in the morning that there were only 20 comfort women left. With the biranga women, women, it's exactly the same situation, literally passing away. Much like the women in Rwanda, Bosnia, and Bangladesh, the suffering of the Rohingya women in the hands of Burmese military and state is unimaginably and incomprehensibly barbaric. Rohingya men and women were brought into the paddy fields and separated. The army picked the most beautiful, fair girls to be taken away to either be raped or kept hostage as sex slaves for an individual or groups of soldiers. The rest were shot dead and dumped into mass graves. Our decade-long research at Restless Beings, which is the organization that I work for, revealed that widespread, widespread sexual violence, many of which were inhumane in nature, including brutal rapes, gang rapes, and other forms of sexual violence using objects, often targeting girls and young women, were carried out to control and spread fear amongst villagers. Girls have been abducted, detained, and raped in military camps. MSF, in their recent report, say that more than half of the girls they have worked with have come from cases of sexual assault, and most of them are 18 years or under, including one girl who was nine years old and several others under the age of 10. They have shown fresh and deep bite marks on their faces and bodies. Their body parts have been mutilated. Many of the women and girls who were raped have since died since their injuries. Rohingya women are doubly marginalized. We hear this very often, double marginalization of Rohingya women, already being one of the ethnic communities, also being Muslim women as well. Having experienced systematic rape, abduction, and torture, and also seeing family members being killed is part of this double marginalization. They have then been forced to flee in, in, in a continued cycle and state of displacement. The women and girls make up just over 50% of the population in the Rohingya camps in Bangladesh, with one in six families being led by single mothers. Although they are now safer from the violence they faced in Burma, Rohingya women continue to struggle, with many suffering silently in the camps. Yasmin mentioned some of this suffering earlier this morning. At Restless Beings, we have interviewed countless women and girls in the last decade, thousands, in fact and gathered shocking testimonies of suffering ranging from women being raped by military to losing children as they cross the border into Bangladesh. They are now dealing with immense trauma, which continues into the camps with many cases of sexual violence, child and forced marriages, and trafficking of women and girls into sex work overseas. I actually witnessed a 13-year-old girl being kidnapped by two Rohingya boys who had been paid by local Bangladeshi um, boys to, to be kidnapped and then trafficked and then um, sold into Thailand um, last year. And luckily, she was, she was okay because the military were around. But this is something that happens all the time. This happens after 5 p.m. once the military have left the camps. One of these women that I met, Shafika, um, is a 28-year-old 20 28 woman. I met her in the winter of 2017. She was pregnant when she arrived on Bangladeshi soil. Her family killed and her village burned. She was then abducted alongside other women and gang raped by Burmese military. She has now given birth and struggling to accept her child and suffering from extreme levels of PTSD. Another case, Nuraya, a pensioner, she was gang raped by soldiers who then took turns to urinate on her body. She remembered all, how many soldiers there were. There were 22 soldiers and I asked her, how did you remember? She said, because they put me on my front and they, they let me see and I could see the different shoes and it was all I remember, the different shoes and the different socks and the different trousers and I knew it was, it was different men. They all then urinated on her and laughed. This was after, also after watching her daughter-in-law get raped and then killed and her grandchildren burnt alive. With all its intersectionalities, genocidal rape must be seen for what it truly is, a tool and campaign for political control and attempts to weaken and wipe out communities. 
Although there are similarities between genocidal rape and the rape in war, both of which involve torture and humiliates, degrades, and demoralizes the other, a distinction must be made between the two. Genocidal rape comes with instruction. It is state sanction, it is systematic, and it is an order to destroy. Genocidal rape is collective sexual violence carried out on civilians by the state, political group, and or politicized ethnic group. The perpetrators are typically part of the state and victims are usually discriminated minority groups, in this case the Rohingya. This is strategic rape under state order and not uncontrolled rape that occurs in conflict zone, which is usually the umbrella through which many nations get away with, with this whole notion of rape being a tool of genocide. These various phases of sexual violence are efforts to shatter a society, rapes to kill and which eventually also end the lives of victims from perpetual mental trauma and societal rejection. In the case of Muslim Rohingya women and girls who were deeply bound to their cultural and spiritual ideals of modesty, privacy and dignity, their bodies were used as vessels through which the Burmese military and state attacked the very core of their being and identity. These women and girls were in the eyes of Burma a mere object through which the destruction of the Rohingya community could take place. In the case of Rwanda, Rape was used as a show of the ultimate disrespect towards Tutsi women. In the Bosnian genocide, rape was used to change the demography of the future Bosnian population with forced impregnation by Serb soldiers and altering the lineage completely. In the case of the Bangladeshi Birangana women, rape was used, to, used by Pakistani forces to mutilate bodies and send ripples of fear across the nation. In the case of the Rohingya, however, all three factors were present. Mass raping of individual women until the point of death Forced pregnancies and mutil 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 mutilation were all present. Furthermore, in October 2016, Suu Kyi publicly, on behalf of the Tatmadaw, claimed rape reports as fake accounts. There was also a peak of rapes in August and September 2017, which tailed off by October 2017, despite violence and deaths continuing until this point. This proves that the point that sexual violence was tactical and deployment of rape was part of the design and implement implementation of genocide against the Rohingya. It is essential, therefore, to expand our understanding and acknowledgement of gendered violence as a vital instrument in perpetrating genocide. Ignoring sexual violence as a core tool of control and annihilation will lead to the failure of any attempt to bring justice to the Rohingya community and individual victims. As academics, activists, international criminal courts, and in general public, we must all recognize and account all the cases of sexual violence that are indicative of genocide. Failure to do so will further embolden the efforts made by Burma of genocidal denial. Thank you. Thank you, Rahima. I was just about to give you the two minutes, so it was very, very efficient, but um, thank you for the exhaustive kind of accounting of the different ways that genocidal rape can be, can be used as a tool um, of oppression. So last but not least, we have Fahana Rahman, who is a PhD researcher and international trust scholar at the University of Cambridge. She, her doctoral research focuses on women, Rohingya women's everyday lived experiences through forced migration. She's also a co-founder of the Silk Path Relief Organization, which is a nonprofit providing humanitarian assistance to individuals de devastated by calamities. And she also works on gender equity, social policy, and human rights, and has uh, published a number of peer review articles on these topics as well. Thank you. Thank you uh, to Dr. Zarni and Mr. Kinam for this opportunity. Um, it's fascinating and it's really humbling for me to, to speak among so many distinguished um, activists and scholars in this room, so thank you. I spent 14 months based at the Rohingya refugee camps conducting ethnographic fieldwork for my PhD, um, though I do continue to go back every few months to continue humanitarian and research work. The talk today that I will give is a very small part of this fieldwork. Um, and a quick note on photographs in my PowerPoint. All pictures you will see have been taken by me and any photos um, showing faces I received direct consent from the women for them to be shared. And it's important for me to mention this as a researcher so that we recognize the ethics of taking photographs amongst vulnerable populations. So as you reflect on tackling sexual violence and rape in the region in this panel, my talk today will, ref will highlight, I hope, an important and seldom heard part of this discussion. 
through Rohingya women's own voices, and Yasmin today um, mentioned this, which I think is an important part of this discussion, uh, that is Rohingya women's narratives of resilience after violence and forced migration. I place at the center of my research these voices of Rohingya women and use an anthropological lens to capture their everyday lives. Violence, specifically um, gendered violence, impacts women and men differently, and as we know, the end of conflict does not necessarily constitute the end of violence. And change in gender relations in refugee contexts particularly reveals this. And it's fitting that we discuss rape in the context of genocide today, um, because my talk will expand on this to think of, of, of violence as a continuum. Um, so how we can understand violence in this continuum. Because the fact remains that once displaced, women are especially confronted with various forms of violence, from the structural to the everyday, during the different phases of their flight. And in the few minutes that I have, I, I will provide a glimpse of the ways in which Rohingya women negotiate and navigate their new environment, which in this case is the Rohingya refugee camps in Bangladesh. Underlying my research is a feminist ethnographic methodology that informs the ethics of my fieldwork process. It is important for me as a researcher to note this point of methodology and my own positionality so that, so that I may interrogate the power of knowledge claims through the position and the questions I ask my interlocutors and the various silences and moments that were unspoken. Much of my fieldwork consisted of spending time with Rohingya women in their huts sharing meals and cooking together, and observing and participating in their daily routines and interactions, noting the moments of solitude, sisterhood, and the sometimes mundane parts of, of being in the camps. Unlike most debates surrounding refugees, which focuses on larger structural needs of refugees, my research takes as its starting point Rohingya women. Capturing power relations and the reproduction of power asymmetries are often neglected in dominant literature on refugee women's everyday subjectivities. I use subjectivity as used in feminist research through stories as ways to understand lived experience. Taking from what Marita Eastman writes is useful in providing insights into how forced migrants understand their sense of self and seek to make sense of displacement, reestablish identity in ruptured life courses and communities, or bear witness to violence and repression. Rohingya women's lives are marked by ambivalence and constraints, but also by creativity in finding ways to deal with their predicament. And it is these everyday creative tactics and contestations that challenge and overturn embedded gendered ideologies regarding women's place in settings after forced migration. In the interest of time, I will focus on three specific narratives. For Rohingyas making the perilous journeys by boat and foot to the refugee camps in Bangladesh, they're at risk, as mentioned by some of the previous speakers, of being caught by smugglers or traffickers and of being captured by soldiers. This is what happened to 17-year-old Zaida, who revealed that the Mog raped her mother, sister, and niece, and sister-in-law, after which they burned her house with all of them inside. She fled her village on her way to Bangladesh and walked through the jungle for 15 days before being captured by soldiers and kept in a cell for five days where she was beaten and raped. She said, they beat me with a rod and tied my hands and feet together on a pole for many days. When I fought back, they shot my leg. She showed me the deep scar all across her thigh, making it difficult for her to walk. She doesn't remember exactly what happened next, but says that after three days, she found herself next to the Naf River with stab wounds on her face and somehow managed to make it across the river to Bangladesh with the help of other refugees who carried her. Throughout my time in, in the camps, I encountered hundreds of narratives that echoed Zaydas. For them, violence not only triggered flight and displacement, but also continued to constitute a challenge and security risk for them while fleeing. The women I met were all very distressed and tra traumatized by the memory of the journey, but the fear of encountering violence did not end there. After these dangerous migrations for weeks and months at a time, life upon reaching the camps remains dismal for Rohingya women. Changing gender identities as a result of conflict and forced migration for both men and women can often result in gender-based violence. Traditional notions of masculinity and femininity related to appropriate gender roles and relations in certain cultural contexts often transform or shift in exile, and in some cases result in increasing incidences of domestic violence. 
Some of my interlocutors told me that they continue to endure rape and abuse within their marriages out of fear of being alone with their children with nowhere to go. This was the case of one of my interlocutors, Hamida. Hamida had recently begun a small sewing business out of her bamboo shack. She has no sewing machine and does all the needlework by hand. And she takes orders for clothes from other women in the neighboring huts. Despite the gender power relations within the family, there were several in instances in the case of my interlocutors, and specifically in Hamida's case, where men no longer serve as a sole breadwinner. Hamida told me, my husband cannot tolerate that I am providing for the family, and he is not. He gets very angry and sometimes beats me. The worst thing is that whatever little money I get, I don't want to give it to him because I know sometimes he wastes the money to buy drugs from the market. But I try to hide some money and I tell him that I have not yet been paid. Even if it's very little, I usually hide the money in my pots and pans because I need to think about my children and save it for them. I know he will never go near the pots. Men's frustration gets exacerbated because of the gendered norms that are embedded strongly in Rohingya culture. Men are expected to be breadwinners and women housekeepers. When I spoke to Hamida's husband, Rafiq, he complained of not being able to provide for his family in a traditional role, which strained relations with, it, with his wife and increased tensions at home. As family dynamics begin to change, in Hamida's case, erosion of male power and privilege at the socioeconomic level, such as through loss of economic opportunities, unemployment, and their inability to reconstruct their position within the boundaries of the family, can have, a, can have consequences resulting in gender-specific violence. But what is also interesting is that Hamida's narrative reveals the subtle tactic she employs, that is, hiding the money from her husband, as an act not only of resistant, but also of resilience to deal with her difficult situation. In many ways, my interlocutors employed these various tactics and strategies to manage and negotiate their surroundings. It is this tactic of resilience, as Nina Gren writes, that in the context of profound suffering causes a creative shaping of notions of self to take place. Rohingya women are having to assume redefined roles as they struggle to create a space for themselves in their new surroundings. They ultimately strive to compose a life, to borrow from Mary Catherine Bateson. For many women, like the ones I met, despite the difficult living conditions in their host communities, which create particular gendered vulnerabilities, they are able to seek out opportunities for empowerment and develop independence and resilience, and in many cases, they create kinships and bonds with other women to create a sense of normality in displacement by finding dignity in the mundane. This was evident in the story of one of my interlocutors, Zannat. One hot afternoon in January 2018, on the top of a high hill in the Balukhali settlement, I sat inside the hut of my 19-year-old interlocutor, Zannat Ara, with her friend and two aunts who joined us from a neighboring hut. The older women sat in a semicircle, their legs outstretched, chewing on pan, and watched as Zannat and her friend went to the back of their hut and brought out a small container. Having completed their tasks for the afternoon, Zannat and her friend were excited to finally have some time to themselves for their favorite activity, putting on makeup and wearing tanaka the yellow paste made from ground tree bark, distinct to the culture of Myanmar. Zannat shared with me, I remember the time when I was humiliated and abused. He was going to rape me. The man was coming for me and he started touching me aggressively. I didn't know what to do. He was putting his hand inside my shirt here. I felt dirty and disgusting. But now, whenever I feel sad or think about the bad times, I wear tanaka and I've put on lipstick and this eye powder. It makes me feel beautiful again, beautiful and happy again, even if only for a short time. Nobody can take away this feeling. This picture was taken right after this particular moment. There is Zannat with her tanaka. In the face of profound transformation and dislocation, refugee women like Zannat search for a, search for a sense of normality and continuity in their everyday lives, something that is simple as applying tanaka and other makeup provides. For her, it is also a coping mechanism. Refugee women are often portrayed as devoid and deprived of their dignity without beauty left in them. For Rohingya women, their humanity is stripped of them in the social imaginary. Yet the remaking of a social world is achieved through the endless repetition of these small, mundane events in domestic quotidian routines. In many ways, it is this tactic of resilience in the face of adversity that allows us to understand what it means to pick up the pieces and continue to compose a life. 
this very active mundanity that makes Zannat look and feel good and brings a sense of normalcy back into her life had essentially become her human right, the right to celebrate oneself. These are only short snippets of the vast expanse of Rohingya women's lived experiences. And though they may seem mundane to us, by focusing on Rohingya women's subjectivity and the telling of their lived experiences, it helps us to gather a complete picture of the lives of these ordinary individuals in extraordinary circumstances. Zayda, Hamida, and Zannat's narratives reveal their tremendous agency in creating and finding ways of belonging, hope, and a sense of normality in an otherwise precarious existence. Rohingya women enact their agency through their multiple strategies, negotiations, and navigations in their new sites of refuge. Understanding these strategies will help us recognize the linkages between gender and resilience and further address specific needs and interests that help compensate for historical and social disadvantages that prevent Rohingya women and girls from otherwise accessing equal opportunities to that of men. Indeed, as we've come today to reflect on the second anniversary of the Myanmar genocide, Protecting women who have survived this brutal attack on their basic humanity begins first with simply listening to the voices of Rohingya women themselves. Their stories are not merely of victimization, but of resilience and strength. It is as Zanna beautifully expressed towards the end of one of our conversations, I had no will to live, but look at me now. I am surviving. Thank you. Thank you, Farhana, for that wonderful kind of glimpse into these women's lives, um, which include both these moments of beauty as well as more complicated moments, um, including um, gendered oppression and, and conflict within their community as well, which is, I think, outside, while outside of our, our broader topic today, still very relevant in the, the bigger issue that we're, we're looking at. So with that, I think we have about 10 minutes before the next panel. Um, I think what we've been doing is um, taking questions in groups of four. And um, for the people with questions, if you could identify if your questions are uh, uh, directed at any particular panelists or just broadly at all the panelists and we'll have the panelists respond to the questions four at a time until we get through the 10 minutes. So with that, um, do we have any questions do we have? Okay. Yeah, I'm up. Sorry, uh, thank you very much. And thank you very much for uh, all the uh, presentations. Uh, very insightful. Uh, that I, I just, I just a, a brief comment on the last uh, presentation. I think it's very important uh, uh, when you pointed out uh, not only the resistance, but also the resilience. Hardly people will see both. Uh, it's easy to see, to, to see one, uh, the resistance. But the resilience, I think, that what makes uh, that woman great. Thank you. Um, uh, a friend of mine who runs the uh, Genocide Documentation Center in Phnom Penh, he was watching and he sent me a note, why are there no men, you know, speaking out on the rape? And I just had to say touche, because uh, women's issue, particularly the, the most heinous crime of rape, you know, other forms of sexual violence, uh, it's not simply exclusively women's issue. It is also men's issue. That was uh, one of the main reasons that uh, I sought out uh, the um, three young Rohingya men to come forward and say what was, until that moment, unsayable in an extremely, uh, you know, essentially sexist, um, uh, you know, Rohingya society. And then the same goes for the Burmese society as well. So uh, <coughs> my um, Question is, um, what are the ways that progressive men, young or old, yeah, uh, you know, help break these um, the foundations and structures of patriarchy? Well, obviously, the system is set up to advance the uh, uh, interests of human beings, men. You know, if we say like, you know, half of the uh, world's population uh, is constituted by women. And if we have uh, the system, uh, the, that is set up to benefit only half of it, and and the men, folks like us, who say like uh, we um, 
We are human rights defenders and we keep silent because uh, we feel like, oh yeah, rape, that's a woman's issue, yeah? Oh, there's a black issue, black lives matter, that white folks stay at home. Um, we are never gonna win. So unless um, we get men uh, come forward and say, say like, we are f I am feminist, we are feminist. You know, simply that we believe in the equality of sexes. And so I, I challenge all the men in this room and anyone who's uh, watching this uh, uh, event on YouTube, to own the rape issue because this is this is not simply woman's issue. This is a human issue. This the issue that cuts across uh, humanity and genders. Thank you. Do we have uh, any other questions? Do we have one more? Any more? Yes, Michimi-san. If there is, there is a large-scale rape, uh, there, then there comes the problem of men who cannot defend the women. So in the camps in Bangladesh, what, is there any difference between the position of men in Bangladesh and uh, uh, inside, inside Burma? I mean, what, is there any change that occurs, uh, that co uh, occurring because they came from uh, Myanmar to Bangladesh. So I guess to summarize the questions, one question regarding what can progressive men do, and then um, kind of a related question in terms of what are the different, like what, what are, how much less vulnerable and what are the difference roles that, that the men in the camps play and how, how are, are, they, are the women in the camp still being, um, I guess, uh, uh, subjected to, to men's authority. And Mame Ew, I think to some extent, maybe that was a, quest, a statement, but if you have a response or uh, 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 feedback on that. So I'll, I'll respond to Zani. Um, I feel like you kind of answered your question a little bit in the sense that you said, um, it's a human rights issue. So ultimately, um, it's about mobilizing young boys and men and changing cultural and the social conditioning that sometimes exists in our world today. So it's changing the way a young boy thinks about women around him, his sisters, his mothers, his friends, but beyond that. The only way I can give an example is, um, so we've been working in Kyrgyzstan for the last um, 10 years or so, and in Kyrgyzstan there's this cultural phenomena called alakachu, which is when a woman is kidnapped and then she's forced into marriage. It kind of happens over 24 hours. A woman or a young girl um, from the age of sort of 15 and above could be on her way to school or university or work, and, and so she's kidnapped either by an individual young boy, um, young man or um, by a group. She's kept overnight. A white scarf is placed on her head by the women of the young man's family. And then she's in a room kind of giving sort of, she's cajoled into saying yes to this man. And she, obviously she's screaming, she's crying, she's saying no. But the moment the white scarf is on her head, um, she's technically married. And then they force her to spend the night in that room. And then the next day when she goes back to her family due to the cultural stigma, she's rejected. And then they are technically married. And then after that, that's it. Whether she stays or she escapes, you know, a lot of the times we hear cases of gang rape. And so one of the biggest problems in Kyrgyzstan, which has changed since, um, is that when it comes to the legislative side of things, if you abduct a cattle, if you steal you know, a cow or a chicken, you get a certain number of years in jail. But if you kidnap a woman, um, you don't get the same number of years. And it's taken us almost you know, 10 years to try and work, we work directly with the government. And when I say work, I mean agitate, um, uh, to then finally get to a point with the local organizations to change things on a legislative you know, position. So now women and cattle are seen as the same. So if a man kidnaps or abducts, you know, kidnaps a woman or abducts, you know, you know, steals chicken and cows, then they get the same level of punishment. We obviously have a long way to go. But one of the interesting things that has happened in the last 10 years of our work in that region, and it's not just in Kyrgyzstan, obviously very um, increased volumes of it, this happens across 18 countries in the world, um, strife across Central Asia, um, is that young boys starting to 
sort of come to us and say, well, hang on, this is not what we want. I was, I, I was born out of a kidnapped marriage. My mother was kidnapped. My grandmother was kidnapped. Culturally, it's accepted. It's what we think. My peers are saying, I'm not a real man if I don't kidnap a woman. But actually, of course, you are. If, if you don't want this for your sister or for your mother, you should not want this for yourself. And it's about changing those attitudes. And so we started to create these help the boys group. And it wasn't about looking at the victims, the young girls or the women who were kidnapped, but it was looking at the boys who needed therapy. You'd, of course you're a real man. Of course you should choose love. Of course you should have the choice and you should give the choice to the woman equally if you are allowed to have the choice. So it's that. I use that example just to explain that, you know, and it, it took years, but now we have groups who are now actively, when a kidnapping happens, these are young boys who have come together in their colleges and their universities and their neighborhoods to actively prevent those kidnappings, to go and help rescue, at the risk of sounding cheesy, um, those young girls who are being kidnapped. And that then changes mindsets. You have to start at a primary level and change those. I hope that answers your question, but I, I think you answered it yourself. Oh, yes. I just want to address both of what, what you said. Um, when I visited the, uh, in Côte Palong, shortly after the 2016 um, clearance operation and then after the 2017 clearance operation. As um, somebody who studied um, victims of abuse, sexual or maltreatment, I was concerned, I was very worried because in the beginning, the first response of men, their husbands, then boys, the brothers and uh, their uncles is uh, they accept it's it's a terrible thing what's happened to my wife or my brother my sister and then after months go by they start to hey wait a minute their attitude changes and then there's violence domestic violence in the homes in the huts and that's where the women are at facing the worst time it's not when they went I mean, it, what they've gone through is horrible too, but they're living this day after day at home with their husbands, not accepting, and, and, and because the men's vulnerability, now they're not able to provide. And women, I was very encouraged to see homegrown women's empowerment groups going through from huts to huts, and of course we have imams trying to stop women from going out of the huts. And, they're, and talking to their husbands and to prevent their wives from volunteering, from working with them. Um, but I was all very encouraged to see recently uh, when through the help of international NGOs, husbands and wives are coming together face to face and they're going to therapy with this first, the first time ever accepting this, what's happened. Um, We've got the Security Council resolutions. We have international norms and standards against um, using rape as a war, uh, as a tool. That's not going to change things. We have to work with the perpetrators we, the, or the potential perpetrators. And we have to work with the general public about what rape means and why it should not be your first choice or any choice for men at all and boys. So, uh, and that has to, that's going to take a long time. And this is what I am saying about this, and I don't like to call it transitional justice, but there has to, and the victim-centered approach is that this has to go in parallel to any criminal proceedings or any criminal accountability processes, that you have to have a, a slow but very intense but um, uh, work with changing the mindset of the people. There is one group uh, in in the in Cox's USA, I'm sure you've heard of um, Shanti Mohila group. Amazing woman. They don't know how to read and write, but they went from hut to hut getting women's signature or their fingerprints to send their testimonies to ICC. And so th this is very, very encouraging. And you're very right. M men have to own all of this 
if they're going to make a new life, a new world for the Rohingya population. Um, just to kind of pick up a little bit on what you were saying as well, Professor. Um, in the camps, you always find child learning centers, child friendly centers, you find women friendly centers and women centers, and you even have elderly centers as well now. Um, age friendly centers, uh, the correct political term. But very, very, very rarely will you see any male oriented centers. Um, and, and actually what ends up happening is we give that responsibility to the imams in the mosques to look after the men and then we fear the imams in the mosque because they look after the men because the men are going to perpetrate further the Rohingya women to you know kind of patriarchal rule so therefore what are we actually doing for the men um, when the children are in their little schools and the women are in their little sewing centers and the old people are taken care of in their centers sipping their tea what do the men do well they look for opportunities to earn but also when you're bored and you feel uh, like your masculinity has been taken away from you because your woman your sister your mother has been raped you try and find a way of recapturing that masculinity so we have to understand the psychological aspect of that and someone mentioned earlier on every day you wake up to the same reality every day you wake up and you're reinvested back into the same thing. And so it's the same mentality for a man in that kind of condition. So the international community also has to have some sort of burden of responsibility to what do we do about those men, right? We can't just say rape is a woman, as, as Zani said, rape is a woman's uh, uh, situation. 50% of the refugees are children. Let's open loads of children's centers. Let's also look after the men. That's part of rape. That is part of the, the, the problem and, and the second rape, etc. I just thought I'd add a few points. I think we're out of time for questions, but I did want to give our panelists um, a chance to comment upon the latest exchange of thoughts. If you guys have anything to say. The Johang, Pimman, and Ira, Heboki, Kingjang, Chuyo, Hadaran, and 어, 말씀에 대해서 조금 어, 설명을 좀 드리고 싶어요. 그리고 마찬가지로 어, 남성들이 변해야 또이 문제가 빨리 해결될 수 있지 않느냐라는 것도 기본적으로 동의를 하는데요. 사실은 그러기 위해서 어, 굉장히 중요한 것이 피해자가 함께 살고 있는 사회가 변화된, 어, 변화되는 게 굉장히 중요하다고 생각을 합니다. 남성, 여성이라는 것 차원을 넘어서서 결국은 어, 사, 그래서 이 성폭력 문제를 해결하는 것도 사회 정의를 실현하는 운동으로 이루어져야 된다고 보고요. 그 차원에서는 가해자 집단이 이 피해자들에게 잘못을 저지른 것에 대해서 명확하게 처벌하는 사례를 남기는 것도 굉장히 중요하지만 다른 한편으로는 그 피해자가 살고 있는 지역 사회에서 특히 남편과 혹은 그 남자 집단에서 이 여성들을 어떻게 인식하는가 하는 것 굉장히 중요하기 때문에 따라서 저희들의 지난 30년의 운동의 역사에서 조금 설명을 드리면 가장 중요한 것이 저희들이 중요하게 생각했던 것이 피해 당사자가 주체적으로 자신들의 문제를 해결하기 위한 그런 운동가가 되게 하는 방법 하나 다른 하나는 그 피해자들을 지원하고 연대할 수 있는 한국 사회를 만들어가는 것 그래서 피해자들의 활동에 위드 유할 수 있는 그러니까 피해자들의 미투에 우리 한국 사회는 위드 유하는 그런 사회를 만들어가는 운동 또 다른 한편으로는 분명히 이제 우리 운동의 사례를 들면 일본에 있는 시민사회가 굉장히 적극적으로 지원하고 연대하는 운동을 운동이 있었어요. 그러니까 그게 없었더라면 아마 지난 30여 년 동안 이렇게 이 운동하는 데서 굉장히 어려움이 많았을 것입니다. 그러니까 우리 어, 다양한 측면의 그런 연대가 필요하다고 생각을 합니다. 피해자 함께 사는 사회 그리고 어, 사, 어, 사죄를 하고 문제를 해결해야 될그 사회의 변화 그것이 동시에 이루어져야 된다고 라 생각을 하고요. 다른 한편으로는 어, 피해자들이 보통 어, 일본군 이안부 피해자들도 피해를 입고 가장 먼저 집으로 돌아왔을 때 어, 가장 가까운 압력 이 누구였냐면 가족이었습니다. 
가족과 동네, 아버지들 내가 무덤에 갈 때까지도 네가 어디 갔다 왔는지 말하지 말아라 침묵을 강요했던 것 이런 것이 여전히 우리 사회에 존재하기 때문에 피해자들이 말하기 어렵고 말해도 그 이후에 공격을 당하게 되고 2차, 3차 가에 노출되기 때문에 운동가로 나설 수 없는 그런 어려움이 있다는 것. 그래서 이 문제를 어떻게 해결할 수 있을까? 저는 앞에도 이야기했지만 역시 한쪽에서는 피해자들을 지원하고 연대하는 그런 시민운동이 굉장히 적극적으로 일어나야 된다고 보고요. 또 다른 한편으로서는 그런 사회를 변화시키는 저항운동. 저항운동도 굉장히 중요하다고 생각을 합니다. 다른 한편으로는 그런 원조 세력을 만들어내는 것, 가해자들이 인정하고 반성하고 처벌을 받을 수 있는 원조 세력을 만들어낼 수 있는 그런 운동들이 함께 이루어진다면 조금 더 말하기 쉬운 운동, 또 행동하기 쉬운 운동, 그리고 모두가 함께 남자든 여자든 모두가 함께 할수 있는 운동이 되지 않을까라는 생각이 좀 들었습니다. 네. Sure. Um, it's just a small point which I was going to mention in my paper but and kind of touches with what you were saying, Professor, about whether there is continued struggling struggle in, in, in the camps in Bangladesh. Obviously, you know, they're safer from the military in Burma. But there is something that we have to... I did a spatial study last year and we measured the size of each of the camps and the number of people living in each of the camps, everything from the width, everything, you know, how it looked, pictures, etc. And this study continued over the space of two years and we did some comparisons both in the old camps where you have Rohingya community members who've been there for the last 22 years and of course the ones from 2017. Um, and something that we have to remember when it comes to looking at the psyche of young boys and men in Bangladesh, in the Bangladesh camps now and why maybe the sexual violence continues in a very different phase but it continues is that there is hypersexualization due to spatial issues. Issues. You have a, 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 a hut that's, you know, four meters by, say, nine meters, and in that hut, what you have is a family of, you know, you have a father-in-law, a mother-in-law, their sons, their wives, and they're all sleeping together with possibly maybe some bamboo and fabric to create some sort of, you know, two spaces or three spaces or a slight cooking area. And then you have young children in that same space staying with them, and these young children are hypersexualized because they can hear their parents or their or their grandparents or their brother and, you know, and his wife. You know, making love, and this is problematic because what we then have is those young boys growing up. You know, from the age of three or four, they don't know what this is, and so they grow up in a in a very tight space inside the camps. And this is something that some of you know we often refer to them as our Rohingya family in the old camps who've been there for 22 years. They have children and grandchildren who don't know what the outside world looks like. They still live in shelters that look exactly like the same shelters that have erupted in the last three years. Their children at the age of 13 and 14 want to get married. If they're not wanting to get married, they want to have physical relations with the opposite sex. And that's because this is what they have grown accustomed to. When you are bored in the camps, you're not allowed education and you have only child safe spaces, NGO system running, running, drip funding, funding, what you're stuck with is extreme levels of boredom. And from extreme levels of boredom comes sexual hyper interest and you know this drive to want to fill up this time and this is problematic and this creates what you have is a million people who will eventually be problematic in many many ways for their host country or for a number of things because what we're doing is 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 we're having a generation of young people growing up in in stifling conditions so i i feel i'd like to add um just the sense of urgency that i think we must all take with us that yes of course we need to take this to icc and you know the international criminal courts and, and and use as many tools as we can to bring justice to this issue but there has to be a sense of urgency to try and support the community right now in as many ways as possible to prevent um to just to to, to prevent um future problems for the for the youth growing up so i just wrapping up all of these very interesting comments i want to make one final thought jumping off of all professor's comments and everybody else's, that despite all of these, you know, the close quarters and, and the way men are having to deal with, you know, whether it's um, lack of opportunities or lack of education or women getting um, the larger uh, uh, 
help from the international community, whether it's through women-friendly spaces, etc., we still need to recognize that men and women have to work together. We can't make this a men's issue. Um, so now we have to start opening up a men's only space that's not going to work. I think that we need to recognize that for men to be brought to the table, we have to get them to talk to the women. What is it, what is it that women want? What is it that the men want? And how can we get both of these sexes to work together in order to prevent any of these um, sexual violence within the camps taking place? And that's only going to happen if we're bringing both parties together. We can't end up having a, a men's only space because they do, at the end of the day, have a larger part of the freedom in the camps. They're able to go, they're able to walk, they're able to you know, freely roam around much more than women are able to. But, but if we're not bringing those concerns from both parties, then there's no common ground. And I think that's important. And that's kind of jumping off of what Zarni also said is how do we bring both parties to the table instead of making this just a men's issue or a women's issue. Okay, I know Thank Kinam you. is hovering, and I take full responsibility for allowing this to go over, but I thought this was a rich discussion at the end that was worth having. Thank you so much. <laughs>